Welcome to our midweek Bible study upon this rock. Uh, this is Solid Rock Drawhada's midweek Bible study. We take a passage of scripture. At the moment, we're doing it with uh, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, and we work through it verse by verse. But we also have a worship song from Janice, and so Janice is going to lead us in a worship song now. Then we'll come back to the Word of God again, and you'll hear me introducing us again, and that's because the teaching portion is recorded for a radio broadcast. But let's worship with Janice now. Thank you to Janice. Uh, my name is Nick Park. This is Upon This Rock. It is a Bible study of First and Second Thessalonians. We're going through it verse by verse, line upon line. And uh, we're not just picking out the bits that we like, but we're looking at every single word of the scriptural text. And uh, this is episode 10, and we've now reached Second Thessalonians and chapter 2. And uh, in verse 13, we read this. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits, or other translations say God chose you from the beginning. To be, It can mean either. To be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. Now, up until now, and if you listened to our last lesson, we were talking about the second coming. We were talking about how the Thessalonians had been warned not to fall into the trap of believing that the second coming had already taken place, that, uh, that it would not happen unless the man of sin was revealed. And it also talked about how there would be a falling away that those, now not talking about genuine born-again believers who knew Jesus, but those who maybe had a nominal Christian faith, would a nominal religion would fall away into apostasy and follow delusions and that eventually they'd follow so many of their own delusions that God would even say off you go then here's a delusion for you to follow 
But Paul doesn't stay on that subject. He comes back now to the Thessalonians and their needs and the desire to build them up positively in the Lord. And and this is one of the balances I love about Paul. Paul recognises evil. Paul calls evil for what it is. But he doesn't dwell upon it. He doesn't get so focused that it's just all banging on about evil all the time. But he builds up the people of God because that is his goal. And really this shows us there's sort of twin dangers here, one extreme or the other, that Christians can fall into and that preachers and churches can fall into. And one of them is to basically ignore sin and particularly the sins around us in culture and society and to ignore them altogether and just to act like everything's wonderful and great and just let's all smile and let's be happy and let's live our best life now. And then the opposite extreme is to become so focused on the things that is evil that we're obsessed with it and that's all we talk about. We're criticising this, we're criticising that, we're criticising the other. We become become increasingly judgmental, but of course the problem with that is we become judgmental more, it's always against others rather than judging our own sins that we are prone to. And both of those are wrong extremes. What God wants us to do, like Paul, is to acknowledge sin and to acknowledge the prevalence of sin around us and the power of sin, but not to focus on it, but to focus on the power of God to deliver us from sin and how we can live gloriously for God, even in the midst of a sinful world. And that's the balance that Paul strikes. So he doesn't stay going on about the man of sin, even though you might be interested in knowing more about him, but he gets back to the Thessalonians and says, but we always thank God for you brothers and sisters. Now, also, here we see Paul talking about the mystery of salvation in that he says that God chose you and also uh, you had to believe the truth. So there's the work of God in choosing, but there's also our part, which is believing on the gospel. And in the midst of that, there's the work of the Holy Spirit in sanctifying us and making us us holy. And again, there's a tendency to go to extremes here. So some Christians go to the extreme on God's choice. And they so stress God's choice and God foreordaining and predestining things that basically it makes it like we've got no choice in the matter whatsoever. That's just, we're, we're just uh, caught up helplessly like, 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 a, like a river and a spirit speck of dirt floating along in the river that we have no say in the matter whatsoever. And then other people take it to the other extreme and they make it all about our choice that you wouldn't believe God was doing any calling at all. And so uh, it's all about, well, here's a choice. You make the right choice. You make the wrong choice. Tough luck if you get the wrong choice. And it's all about us. But both of those approaches are wrong. God calls, God chooses, but we also have to receive the truth. Now, We might struggle in our humanity to understand how they can both be true at the same time. And uh, the great uh, the great Baptist preacher of the 19th century, Charles Spurgeon, he compared it to looking at two sides of a coin because I've got a coin here in my pocket and uh, this coin, it's a it's a 20 cent coin. So on one side of it, it's it's got the. uh, it, it's, it's got the map of Europe and it says 20 cents on it. But on the other side of it, there's a there's a fancy little design. Now, this is a Spanish issued coin. So it's got some kind of Spanish design on the other side. I'm not even got a cross on it or something. I'm not even sure what's that supposed to be. A lot of letters around it that look more like a like a clock face than anything else. I'm not sure what that is. But anyway. What I'm saying is this, you could argue about that. One group of people could argue and say, no, I know what's on that coin. It's got a map of Europe and a big 20 euro cent. But the other, no, no, the other side could say, no, I know what's on that coin. It's like a picture of like a a cross with a lot of numbers around it, like like a clock face. The fact is both are true. But from our human perspective, we can only see one and therefore we can't understand how both can be true. But uh, from God's perspective, God can see both sides of the coin. Now, you might say, but hang on, I can't really understand that. I can't get my head around that. Well, well, no, you probably can't because God is eternal and we are not. God is infinite and we are finite. 
And so we're never going to fully understand God and his ways. There are times whenever we have to accept his word and accept it on faith, even if we can't quite fully comprehend how it all fits together. If God's word says it, then it is true. That's the mystery of salvation. But also, coming into that mix, it speaks about um, that we are we, we are saved through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is also making us holy. Salvation without sanctification, the making holy, is not good enough because just being saved from the, the guilt of sin and the penalty of sin is not enough. We are supposed to be saved from the power of sin as well. There's a beautiful verse in that old hymn, um, Rock of Ages, that speaks about let, let the, the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. And this is the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, that God's gospel saves us not only from the guilt of sin, but also from the power of sin to control our lives and our actions. And then in verse 14, we go on to that. It says, he called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. God chose us, yes, and he called us. And this twin action of God's sovereign grace, his choosing and his calling, and our freely exercised faith in response to that, brings glory to Jesus. And that's why it says that we might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's something wonderful here in that being part of the kingdom of God does not just mean standing off and saying, wow, look at the glory of Jesus, but we actually get to share a part in that glory. How can that be? Well, that's like whenever Peter, James and John were taken up onto the Mount of Transfiguration and it shone with light and, you know, that was the glory of Jesus. But they were also in that bright light as well, having a share of it. And Paul says this is through our gospel. Now, when he says our gospel, he's meaning yeah, him, Timothy and, uh, and Silas. But he's also meaning, as well as that, the other apostles. He's talking about Peter and he's talking about the, the gospels that would, would be written and everything else. That all of this is, is a consistent teaching, the gospel, the gospel that they all preached. In other words, not the false gospel, because there are heretics that are trying to trip up and derail the faith of the Thessalonian believers. And Paul says, well, that's their gospel, but our gospel is a gospel of grace, and our gospel is a gospel of faith, and our gospel is a gospel of the Holy Spirit making you holy so that you can share in the glory of Jesus Christ. And that's infinitely better than these other false gospels that these other people are peddling. Verse 15, so then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. So false teachers were trying to shake the Thessalonians off, and it really is like a shaking off. It's like you're holding on to that sound doctrine, and there's an enemy trying to just shake you off, and you've got to hold on to sound doctrine. Uh, in fact, back in verse 2, it's, it, you may remember it said that there were false letters who were being sent to the Thessalonians pretending to be from Paul. Now, Paul had a way of stopping that, as we'll see in our next lesson. But, um, but Paul's saying, look, there's a consistency of teaching here. And that is the truth, the faith, whether it's by word of mouth or by letter, it's the same. You can recognize the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ by its very character. And this was actually a key principle whenever the early church had to sort out what we call the New Testament canon. In other words, which books are in the New Testament. Now, if you've read novels like The Da Vinci Code, now reading a novel is not a good way to learn about history and early Christianity, but if you've read a novel like The Da Vinci Code, it sort of makes out that they had a church council and they just said, let's pick this book. Ah, no, we'll kick that one out. Let's pick this one. And that all these other books that may be uh, perfectly great and God speaking have somehow been rejected. But that's not the case. What the early church councils did was they basically recognized the books that were already being used by the church and recognized by churches all over the place as being authoritative. And the reason for that 
was because there was a character to them. There was a consistency in their teaching. It doesn't matter whether you're looking at the Gospel of John or the Gospel of Mark or Paul's letters or First and Second Peter or, or Jude or James or Hebrews or whatever. When you look at them, you can see a consistency in the teaching. And it's, you know what, it's like authentic. You can immediately see, yeah, this is, this is, this is real. Whereas if you've ever looked at some of these other books, and they are freely available, they're not hidden or secret or destroyed. They're online. You can look them up. These are the books that didn't make the cut and weren't accepted by the churches and therefore never made it as into the Bible. You, you know, you can tell just by looking at them that their quality, their doctrine is vastly inferior to that of the New Testament books. So it's this principle that they should stick hold, to, stick firmly taking hold of the faith whether it was by mouth, by Paul, or whether through uh, the letter, the first letter of Thessalonians, and now the second one, and subsequently other letters and other New Testament writings. Verse 16. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, may he encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Now, you see, what you've got to recognize here is that there were these false teachers, but this whole thing is about God strengthening in us. It's not about Paul. Paul's not fighting the false teachers to prove Paul is better. This is, this is not Paul versus the false teachers. This is the false teachers versus God, because Paul's saying the true gospel and the truth of Scripture is telling us about our Lord Jesus, God our Father, about his grace, giving us eternal encouragement, good hope, and God's word, God's true doctrine, encourages your hearts and strengthens you in every good deed and word. And then we move into chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honoured just as it was with you. And this is something you'll see repeatedly in all of Paul's letters. He knew he needed prayer even if it was from baby Christians, like the Christians at Thessalonica, who hadn't been Christians for only a few months. Uh, even if it was from problem Christians, like those in Corinth, Paul would still ask them to pray for him. Because Paul knew he needed prayer. And if Paul needed prayer, how much more do we? He, he says that this, he says, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly. And the word spread rapidly literally is run. It's talking about like running in a race. Um, he's saying that this message of the Lord may run like an athlete fast. It's the same word that we find in uh, Hebrews 12, having uh, where, where Paul says, therefore, because we are surrounded by such a, or the writer says, therefore, because we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance. It's this same word, run. He's saying, let the message of the Lord may, may run rapidly and be honoured, just as it was with you. May it now spread to the other places where Paul is ministering. And pray, verse 2, and pray of chapter 3, pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not everyone has faith. Now, in Greek, this is very specific. If you look at the, the, the Greek New Testament, it's, uh, the language of it is very clear by the, 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 the tense. He's not, saying, he's not saying, let us be delivered from wicked people in general. He's actually saying those wicked and evil people. So he's talking about something that was going on in Corinth. Paul was in Corinth when he wrote both these letters to the Thessalonians. And he's saying that he's facing their wicked and evil people who do not have faith. They have rejected faith. They've rejected the gospel and they've moved to active opposition. Because there's something about the gospel that attracts enmity rather than indifference. Uh, you know, atheists are very rarely atheists. They're mainly anti-theists. They're not just saying, well, I don't believe in Jesus and leave it at that. But they want to argue against Christianity because there's something about the gospel that makes it hard to sit on the fence. You're either on one side or the other. You're either with God or you're against him. Verse 3, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. So, yeah, there's going to be trouble. Yeah, trouble will come. But faith, but God provides faithfulness, strength and protection. And he protects you from the evil one. He protects you from Satan. 
because Satan attacks you. Now, I've heard teachings going about by people who think they're experts in spiritual warfare, where they say, oh, Satan doesn't attack you. It's just some minor detail because his ranks of demons and all this stuff makes them sound very spiritual, like they know what they're talking about. But actually, the Bible says that God will protect you from the evil one, from Satan himself. Satan himself wants to attack us, but God protects us because God is stronger than Satan and he is faithful. Verse 4, we have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. Because what was Paul commanding them to do? To love one another, to rejoice, to prefer one another in honour, to forgive one another. And they were the things that the Thessalonians were doing. So Paul can hear all this and he says, despite all the, the problems, despite the persecution, despite the false teachers, God is obviously moving among you. And then in verse 5, which is the last verse we're going to look at, we'll, we'll deal with the rest of chapter 3 uh, next week. Uh, he says, May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. There's a beautiful picture here, and it's that of a shepherd. Our hearts are restless and wandering. And just as a shepherd directs the sheep into where the areas where there's safety and good food, the good shepherd directs our hearts, our wandering, restless hearts. The good shepherd directs them into good places. And those places are God's love and God's perseverance. So Paul says, may the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. Uh, that We're going to cause a, bring a halt to it there. And we will rejoin uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Uh, in our next study, which will be the final episode, episode 11 of our study of First and Second Thessalonians. I invite you to join us for that. Uh, until then, God bless you in Jesus' name. We will be back here again for our study next Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. here in my office on our Facebook page, Solid Rock Drogheda, and also on our website, www.solidrock.ie. Hope to see you then. Stay blessed until that time. God bless you.